we uh, begin a series this morning from Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is just full of good stuff. And uh, we're going to begin a series with that this morning. Uh, in Psalm 119, it's kind of a, just a little bit of interesting uh, info about it. The, Psalm 119 is, is broken down into sections. And if you know your ABCs in Hebrew, I don't. <laughs> but if you do, <laughs> you'll see that the first letter uh, of each <coughs> section, or what you may see there is a word, it is really the alphabet, the ancient alphabet of the uh, uh, Hebrew language. And it's fascinating as you go through and you look at each one, you go through your ABC. So think of it this way, today we're going to be looking at A. I, I, I'm not really calling it that. It's actually, if you look at this picture this morning, you can't help but laugh. I thought this was the greatest picture. Today we're talking about what it means to be happy. Everyone likes to be happy, right? Yeah, everybody put that smile on your face. I see some of it. You, you can't help but smile looking at this guy. To be happy. We're all searching for that way to be happy. Psalm 119 with verse 1 this morning begins to tell us how to be happy. Ah, that's a great way to look at it, huh? Ah, we... This, this must be one of those good sermons that we can walk away feeling great about, right? We're going to be happy today. <laughs> the psalmist this morning focuses on this entire psalm. Who is, uh, who is precious in God's eyes. And we're looking at these precious words from God. The psalmist reverts back to God's statements of direction. Throughout the Old Testament, everything goes back to the Ten Commandments. The promises, the statutes of God. You think, well, oh, great. Everything goes back to a bunch of rules. No. No. It actually goes back to Ten Commandments, where God can tell us how to be happy. Well, that sounds kind of strange, isn't it? That the Ten Commandments are supposed to make you happy. Well, yeah. We follow those Ten Commandments, and we find the blessing, the happiness that God provides. God's Word can bring happiness. Let's look at verse 1. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who live according to the Lord's instruction. Happy are those who keep His decrees and seek Him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They follow His ways. You have commanded that your precepts be diligently kept. Wow. To be happy, you have to follow His Precepts. That's pretty good. Happiness is more than, a, than an, an emotion. We kind of think about being happy than we have this great emotional feeling. But happiness goes even deeper. The word happiness actually is better translated as blessing. That you have a blessing of your life. Now, when we see the word blessing, it, it actually... Uh, it's what uh, those things that bring us peace with ourselves, but also with God. That's what a blessing is. It is the way of being, having peace with God and with ourselves. That sounds kind of strange. It sounds like it's a little bit inward. Well, it is an inward look at it. To be happy with ourselves or to have peace with ourselves, we must first have peace with God, right? Otherwise, whatever we do, whatever we think, however we feel, means absolutely nothing unless we have peace with God. Happiness comes to those who are blameless. There's that word blameless in there. 
Being blameless means to be without blemish. Sin is a blemish of our relationship with God. It's an imperfection. This past week, I did a little shopping in Reno. I said I did shopping, I didn't do buying in Reno. But one of my favorite places to go is to a store that has seconds. You know what I'm talking about? There are those things that did not come out of the manufacturer uh, perfect. And if it's, you're talking about clothing, um, it did not have the seal of approval of the inspector. Do they still have those um, little pieces of paper they put in clothing that says inspected by? I, I don't know if I've seen that recently, but maybe, maybe they do. You want to know who inspected your, your britches, right? Okay. I, I guess that's important. But the, the ones that I saw... Um, this rack full of clothes were seconds. They were not approved by the Inspector A or whoever. And so you can, usually you can get a pretty good deal on those clothing, now that clothing, as long as you don't mind a few little wrinkles here and there. Sin is the second or the blemish of our lives on our heart. And God is the one who takes away that blemish. And the psalmist here is asking uh, to be happy because he wants to be blameless before God. And sin brings a, an imperfection to our heart. Because of sin, our human nature, we are blemished and not approved for that inspection. But also we see happiness happens when we follow God's commands, His decrees, it says, to seek Him. We cannot experience God without first desiring to follow God's direction. It is important to be obedient to God's direction because we also have to remember that God was obedient to His own direction. If you think about that for a second... God made promises. He made promises from the very beginning. He made promises to Abraham. He made promises to Adam and Eve. He, from the very beginning, He made promises. And His promises held true all those years. And guess what? His promises hold true today. And so if we look at this and we see that He has promises, He is obedient to His own promises. So that means that we must be obedient to His precepts, His promises, His commands, His decrees as well. It says in that day God's precepts led to the safety or salvation of God. Today we are guaranteed salvation or safety in God by recognizing the grace given through the sacrifice of Jesus. If we trust in Him, if we ask Jesus into our heart, if we have a life that is transformed for Jesus, for God, then we have that salvation. That is great to think about that it's a done deal. It's, it's a great thing to think about that, uh, that if we're e obedient to His salvation, taking Him, then we are blameless because of Christ's salvation when he went to the cross. His decision to go to the cross, being obedient before God, obedient, obedient before himself, he decided to go to the cross so that we could have salvation. So that we no longer have to be blemished. We no longer have to have that sin that has blemished our lives. It's because of that we can trust in him. The psalmist also decrees or declares that he is, he is not measuring up to what is expected. You know, we, we find that. Look at what it says in verse 5. Verse 5 says, If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes, then I would be ashamed when I think about your commands. Hmm. Ashamed. That word shame, oh, that's a, a rough one to think about. 
God's judgment on the guilty is the, the finality. And as we look at this, because he can be found with imperfection, as, as, as the psalmist can be found with imperfection, he experiences shame and guilt. Do you ever feel guilty? I won't look at you as you admit it. And every once in a while, of course, matter of fact, our lives are a time when we do feel guilty. Why do we feel guilty? Why do we feel shame? Because we are not following the precepts or the things that God expects of us to make ourselves righteous, which means right with Him before Him. Now, I understand if you have salvation and you've uh, had that relationship with Jesus Christ, then salvation is set. But how miserable we can feel, the shame that we feel because of our own sin. And the Bible says, don't let that, uh, that sin, that shame, uh, overcome you. And the psalmist here is saying, he's having trouble with that. He, he'll continue to have trouble with that. By the way, it's not a bad thing to have shame. It's not a bad thing to have guilt. Let me tell you why. That's the Holy Spirit working in your life. That's the Holy Spirit telling you, hey, things aren't right between you and God right now. You need to work through this. You need to make sure that you bring this to Him and ask for forgiveness. Sin is what brings us to shame and guilt. Not anybody else's sin, but our own. I think it's so important to look at that. It is our own sin that brings us to that. And just as the psalmist is experiencing anguish because of his unfaithfulness, so we also experience that same anguish. This anguish separates us from God. The anguish of guilt and shame is a measurement of the re uh, rejection of God. That's kind of a weird way of looking at it. Measurement. Guilt and shame can be a measurement of our relationship at that moment, at that time, with God. That's, that's okay. We need that measurement because the Holy Spirit's working with us, in us and saying, let's get this right. Let's work on this. Let's make this right. We're glad to have a loving God who will always forgive us. Isn't that nice? We go on with verse 7. It says, I will praise you with a sincere heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Never abandon me. God's judgment on the guilty is the finality of his gift of salvation. <laughs> judgment seems like a harsh word. We don't want to hear that word judgment, do we? <clears throat> Especially when we think about a judge sitting on a, I don't know what you would call it. What is that thing where he sits on? And, the bench. The bench, thank you. Uh, glad I have that back up. I, the, it, as he sits on the bench, and you think about a judge that way, looking down and ready to give his sentence. Well, yeah. But judgment isn't necessarily a bad thing. It is a bad thing in one sense, but it's also a, bad, a good thing. Judgment sounds like a harsh word. And it really is harsh. The harsh reality is that sin separates us from God. The judgment of sin is death, but the gift of God is through Christ Jesus. Romans 3.23. Or 6.23. To have the finality of our existence, we must face judgment. We're all going to face that judgment, as the Bible says. We're going to stand before the judge at the end of our life. And he's going to say to you, hey, you, you as, as you stand before me and I give you that judgment, you either have received heaven or you've received hell as your judgment. Receiving heaven is a great judgment, isn't it? I like that. I'd like to have that kind of sentence. Sentence to heaven. Hmm. E 
eternal uh, ascendance to heaven. That would be. But you know what? The neat thing is, is that we make the choice now of what our sentence is going to be. We make the choice now whenever we go before the judge because we face the judge is to have our sentence passed for our sin. We are all sinners. But judgment can be good if we have the right advocate. It's not that we have someone who is the, the lawyer for us, the attorney. No, we need an advocate. An advocate is the one who stands between us and the judge. Who, who is the one who says, this person accepted me. This person uh, may not deserve to have eternal life, but I stepped in the place of, for them and gave them the opportunity to have eternal life. Because they chose me. That's a great advocate. And who's that advocate? The advocate is the Son, Jesus Christ. Wow! That's a, that's a great way to think about it, that, that Jesus, the advocate, stands in the way of our sentence to hell if we choose now to accept him as the advocate. Mm -hmm. well, that, that is a great way to look at it. Obedience to call on the advocate now can bring future glory. And God should be praised for his judgment. <laughs> we look at that and think, oh man, we should thank the, the judge for passing a sentence on us? Yeah, that's a good thing. I, I, I look forward to that judgment. But you know, as, as we talk about this, the psalmist makes a promise to keep trying. He says, I, I've blown it. I haven't done a great job at this. It seems like I keep going back to my, my old way of thinking. I don't follow those precepts. I don't follow those commands. I, I, I have sin in my life. And, you know, that's okay. Sin is in our lives because we are in a sinful place. But the Bible says that we can come to Him with our sin. And what does that mean? He will take that and He will forgive it. And we can have that guilt taken away. We can have that shame taken away. Wow. He says, I, I'm going to work harder. The psalmist says, I'm going to work harder at this. It is impossible for us to be perfect in our own actions. But it should be our desire to serve Him. It should be our desire to be righteous before God. We are not perfect. We are blemished. And as long as we are in this world, we are going to be blemished. But our advocate, Christ, has taken the blemish away from us because of what he did on the cross. Regardless of how good we think we can be, regardless of how much money we give to a good organization, <clears throat> No matter how much we try to be good before God, it doesn't matter. It's important to do so. We should have a desire to do these things that, that, that as we come before God, it should be our desire to serve Him. But as long as we are in this world, it is through Christ who gives us the opportunity to go to heaven. Isn't that the ultimate goal? Isn't it the ultimate goal, goal to go to heaven? I, I like being here. Some days I like it more than others. This is a, this is a great life. We, we get the gift of life. But... I'm looking forward to the ultimate goal, the everlasting life in heaven. But we have a choice now between the everlasting life in heaven or the everlasting life in hell. We make that choice to take up the advocate. What does it mean to be truly happy? To not be guilty, to be shameless, 
before a loving, judging God. I emphasize loving and judging. Because he's both. His promises are for both. Not one or the other. His promises are for, for both loving and judging. It's not our job to judge. It is our job to love. But it is his job to both love and judge. Why? Because he said he would. I kind of bank on that, you know? It's because of what he said. He loves us with an everlasting Everlasting is a long time, isn't it? Did somebody measure that for me? No, of course not. That's how much he loves us. And because of that love, we can be blessed. Or we can be happy. I don't know, after a while you keep looking at the guy, you get a little creeped out. But... <laughs> Anyway, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to really know you. Not just know about you, but to really know you. Thank you, Father, for being a God of love. But also, thank you, Father, for being a God of judgment. We praise you for that. We worship you for that. We worship you for who you are. And Father, I ask that if there is someone who has not found the peace that goes beyond the shame and the guilt, that they'll come to you right now and ask for forgiveness and receive Jesus in their lives. I pray for that today. I pray that our hearts will be focused on you when we take our own guilt and our own shame away and we come to you, come before you and ask for forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for that. In Jesus' name.